Hello everybody and welcome to Drydock episode 169. This week the questions are taken from guide 223 on USS Astoria, the cruiser specifically rather than the class, and the second night action of the big naval battle of Guadalcanal. So let's get into questions. Calico Jack Rackham asks, why were the Atlanta class cruisers used in ship-to-ship -ship combat instead of their proper role as anti-aircraft defence? There are a couple of reasons the, why the Atlantis found themselves on the receiving end of enemy gunfire. Firstly, the Atlantis had actually originally been designed as surface-to-surface -surface combat vessels, not anti-aircraft vessels. Their transition to use as anti-aircraft cruisers came about during the World War II period as a result of the analysis of what their actual capabilities were and the fact that their original role pretty much didn't exist. Originally, the Atlantis had been designed to help support the cruiser screen, the fleet screen, and destroyers against incoming enemy destroyers that were trying to attack the U.S. battle line. But thanks to Pearl Harbor, the U.S. battle line in 1942 didn't really exist, and so you're going to need to put the Atlantis to other uses. Now, granted, the Atlantis were never supposed to engage other cruisers in head-to-head -head combat. In fact, um, one particular U.S. Navy official was so derisive of both the protection and armament of the Atlantis that he would, tried to insist that they be referred to specifically as destroyer flotilla leaders and not light cruisers. His argument basically being they can't win a fight against a light cruiser, so why are we calling them this? But nonetheless, they were designed for this anti-destroyer work. In the context of the Guadalcanal campaign, the Atlantas were useful on two counts. One, very prosaically, the US was running out of active cruisers, so it's better to have something that's maybe not ideal for the job of fighting other enemy heavy surface ships, but still can do something, than not have it at all. Secondly, of course, was the fact that despite the fact there wasn't a battle line to protect, the Japanese still did have a lot of destroyers, and the Atlantis were perfectly suited to killing destroyers. So, whilst the other cruisers, in theory, the bigger ones, could deal with the Japanese cruisers, hopefully the Atlantis could support the relatively scarce US destroyer formations in fending off the Japanese torpedo armed destroyer units. And of course, that goes double for this, but when you consider the fact that at the time the US Navy generally believed that the Japanese torpedoes were relatively short range and so would be envisaging the Japanese ships trying to get fairly close to launch torpedo attacks. So that's why they were there. As it turned out, the role that everyone had said, the one thing they were specifically not supposed to do, which was to fight other enemy heavy surface warships, was one a disturbing number of them ended up having to do in 1942 and I mean, damage and loss resulted therefrom. Friendly fire and submarine torpedoes not helping, obviously. Eric Hutton asks, Seeing how well the American PT boats, destroyers and cruisers did at Surigao Strait, were the seven old battleships perhaps a bit superfluous? Not necessarily. I mean, it's, it's somewhat easy to make that argument post-fact, but you've got to consider that specific scenarios are simply the where the dice fell on that particular day. Whereas the fleet commanders back then had to decide things on the basis of a plausible worst case scenario or even a general case scenario, because some circumstances were pretty unique. Now, what I mean by that is that when you look at your destroyer PT boat cruiser mix, yes, in theory, they would be fairly lethal. But thanks to US tactical decision making, none of the cruisers, bar a couple of the Atlantas, had torpedoes anymore so if you wanted to use torpedo armament you had to rely on destroyers and pt boats and once you factored in night you weren't going to get any air support either so that meant if you were up against heavy enemy assets i.e battleships then if you really wanted to hurt them and you didn't have battleships of your own you're going to need your light craft the destroyers and pt boats however destroyers and PT boats especially are fairly sensitive to weather. If the weather is really bad of a night, your PT boats are probably not going to be able to operate at sea. So that immediately cuts out a bunch of the torpedo you've got. So that leaves you with just destroyers and cruisers. Destroyers tend to suffer 
loss of speed in heavy seas and can be not the world's best platforms for offensive action. So that might eliminate your destroyers from the engagement. And even if they're not, it's going to play, play, mean that they have to get into a much closer engagement in order to guarantee that they're actually going to be able to hit anything. The closer they get, of course, the more likely they are to be counter-batteried by, uh, let's say, an enemy battleship secondaries, possibly even their main armament. And you don't know exactly what strength and what numbers the enemy is going to come up with. So if the enemy comes with their own destroyers and maybe some cruisers, then your destroyers might very well be picked off and your cruisers might have a great deal of difficulty supporting your destroyers against the enemy screen because you know the big battleship might be take or battleships might be taking them apart so in this kind of plausible worst case scenario of rough seas and nighttime an enemy force that consists of a half decent destroyer cruiser screen and some capital units would in all likelihood, be able to force their way through a screen that's made entirely of cruisers, destroyers, and PT boats. And so an admiral in command would have to take that into account, and the way to plug that potential capability gap is to have battleships of your own. Now, if the night is calm and the enemy screen isn't up to all that much and the enemy fleet isn't that large, then yeah, sure, your PT boats, destroyers, and cruisers will wipe it out. But you can't guarantee that's going to be the situation. You could, very well could have ended up in a situation where Greta's center force actually becomes the southern force. And I can guarantee you, whatever maybes might be argued around the southern force being taken out without 7th Fleet's battleships present, if it had been Greta's center force that showed up as the southern force, there is absolutely zero chance that a battle line made up of just cruisers, destroyers, and PT boats would have been able to stop them that night. To be perfectly honest, even the chances of 7th Fleet's battleships entirely stopping them that night are possibly a little bit in question, but that is, shall we say, less certain. That would need a bit more uh, analysis on wargaming to discover the likely outcome of. Jake Galvin asks, how much of an effect did Soviet submarines and the Soviet Navy in general have on the war? So the Soviet Navy had a rather varied impact on the war. You've got to bear in mind that, as with pretty much all of the big wars that Russia fought in the 20th century, its forces were split across multiple theatres. So what the Soviet Navy was doing in the Arctic Sea was different to what it was doing in the Baltic, which was different to what it was doing in the Black Sea, which was different to what it was doing in the Pacific. Broadly speaking, though, the surface units of the Soviet Navy were generally, especially in the early part of the war, confined to helping with evacuations and shore gunfire support against the advancing German forces. Then once the sieges of the big cities settled in, helping to defend those cities by, again, anti-aircraft work and gunfire support. And in that role, a lot of ships were lost, basically, as things were attritioned down. There was a fair amount of smaller craft activity during the war in the Baltic and Black Seas, but broadly speaking, that was the role of the Soviet Navy for the majority of the Second World War. Um, in the Black Sea, there were a bit more evacuation and resupply runs going on as opposed to in the Baltic, where it really was back up against the wall time. In the North, what you might call the Northern Fleet in the Arctic Ocean, the Russians did help somewhat with Arctic convoys, but they had limited numbers of ships, and some of their, the ships they had there weren't actually brilliantly suited for escorting Arctic convoys anyway, uh, but they did what they could. Over in the Pacific, obviously, Russia wasn't at war with Japan for the majority of the war, so there were some Lend-Lease convoys in that area, but broadly speaking, it was a relatively quiet theatre of operations for the Russians right up until, you know, right into 1945, when all of a sudden it wasn't for a brief time before the Japanese gave up. When it came to the uh, Soviet submarine force, however... <clears throat> they were a lot more active 
particularly in the Baltic. Um, and you can probably say the Soviet submarine force was the single most active offensive arm of the Soviet fleet, period. They did suffer considerable losses, but they were active pretty much from day one, constantly trying to attack Axis shipping all through the Baltic, and occasionally scored some fairly spectacular successes. And occasionally also you had things like the sinking of the Wilhelm Gustloff, which was technically a spectacular success for the submarine captain, but not necessarily one that anyone's going to be celebrating anytime soon. The other element you've got to remember when it comes to the Soviet Navy is that they have their own naval infantry, the Soviet um, naval infantry, and they also have their own air force, and both of those were deeply involved in the land campaigns as well as some soviet ships landing guns to help in the land campaigns and there's a, a whole swathe of involvement there which is a very interesting bit of history but only something i'm aware of at a relatively basic level i know where they fought and when and what actions they're in but the details obviously being a land-based thing is not really within my purview of of expertise Josh Thomas Moore asks, if the Japanese had decided to ignore the risk to large ships that they thought there was and sent actual battleships into the two major parts of the naval battle of Guadalcanal, not just two Congo-class battle cruisers, which of the battleships would have been most useful to them? So you've broadly got the four classes of battleship that the Japanese had available. So you've got the Fusos, the Iseis, Nagatos, and Yamatos. Of these, although in combat, their multiplicity of turrets and the fact they're probably the most expendable would seem to make them the ideal candidates, I think we actually need to rule out the Fusas and the Isais fairly early on, purely on grounds of their speed. One of the major factors of all the Japanese operations around Guadalcanal was the fact that they needed to be able to run ships in quickly enough that they could stay out of range of most American air cover right up until the last possible moment. Then as soon as darkness fell, they'd have the speed to get in, conduct operations, and get out again. And the Fusas and the Isais don't have that. Which leaves you with the Nagatos and the Yamatos. Now, as I've said before, when in response to other questions, a Yamato probably would have survived the pounding that Kirishima got and then returned it in earnest. Plus, I don't think South Dakota would have been left afloat uh, if it had been a Yamato that had had free fire on her for a fairly extensive period of time. So, on paper, putting Yamato and Musashi in instead of the Congos would seem to make the most sense. They're almost as fast. They're the fastest of the battleships that the Japanese have. They're the most heavily armed, they're the most heavily armoured. Everything looks fine and rosy sending those in. However, in terms of most useful, that much I'm slightly hesitant to give credit for, mainly on the grounds that they are the capital ship units of the Japanese Navy, and getting one or both of them heavily damaged, if not sunk, would be a fairly major blow and would significantly influence future naval campaigns. Now, obviously, with hindsight, you can make the argument that, you know, especially Musashi never really did all that much of importance. Yamato, apart from one engagement at um, Leyte Gulf, again, really doesn't accomplish all that much, so you might as well use them at Guadalcanal. But the simple fact that they existed and were deployed in various operations after the Guadalcanal campaign did weigh quite heavily into Japanese strategic thinking. So whilst on a very sort of close, close zoomed in level, yes, the Yamatos would have been the best use. Again, with slightly with the benefit of hindsight, but also partially with the benefit of, you know, people sitting there going, what might happen afterwards? I don't think I'd necessarily take them, which leaves you with the Nagatos, and I think those would be the ones that offer the best balance, because they're heavier armed than either the Fusos, Isais, or Congos. They're still relatively fast, so if you push them, they might just about make it in the sort of run 
down from the north during daylight, run in close at night and pull out again just in time. That They might be able to pull that off. They're a bit better protected than Congos. They're not brilliantly protected, but to be honest, being better protected than Congos is not difficult. Um, and they are considerably more expendable than the Yamatos are. Plus, if we're going to use a little bit of hindsight, we know Mutsu will explode the following year without accomplishing all that much. And Nagato, pretty much like the like Yamato, really only shows up in earnest at Leyte Golf, and that's it. So, if I was trying to persuade the Japanese Navy in mid to late 1942 to send in battleships, either instead of or as well as the Congos, I think I would be aiming to get the Nagatos in because they'll do, as I say, they'll do considerably more damage, they've got a somewhat better survival chance, and their speed means that they might just about also not be murderously annihilated by American air power the minute they so much as look in the general direction of Guadalcanal. René Provosti asks, Could you speak about the relationship of operational doctrine to technical advances? Yes, yeah, so operational doctrine does to a certain extent, in fact, a very, a very large extent, depend on technical advances or is very heavily influenced by technical advances. But I think it comes down to when you're looking at that into two broad categories. So you have operational doctrine that is enhanced by a technical advance, but otherwise remains overall the same, and operational doctrine which is enabled by or created by a technical advance. So in the case of, let's say, the... Actually, an example of both. The line of battle. So the line of battle initially is brought about and enabled by a significant technical advance, i.e. the development and deployment of large numbers of guns aboard warships and the commensurate changes in ship design to accommodate lots of guns on the broadside along with some standardization as to roughly what equates to a warship, because prior to that you did have guns and you did have warships equipped with guns, but they had all sorts of weird and wonderful tactics, including kind of merry-go-round, all-round fire techniques, etc. So initially it's a case of a technical advance enabling this new operational doctrine of the line of battle. But once you go from a line of battle of the early sort of Galleon era age of sail, through the classic age of sail, the Napoleonic era, into the 19th century, and then even into the early 20th century, the line of battle pretty much remains recognisable to some of those earliest advocates of it. Okay, sure, the ships themselves change, and the distances at which they fight change, although somewhat late in the day, right up at the beginning of the 20th century, but fundamentally, the idea of the line of battle doesn't change that much. It's just the fine detail of how it's executed. So that's an example of where a technical advance alters the the intricacies of a particular doctrine, but doesn't actually change it all that much. But then you can look, especially in, let's say, the... 1850s to the 1950s, um, oddly enough, the era that this channel covers are quite a bit, and you can see all sorts of technological changes either updating, obsoleting, or enabling various operational doctrines. So, for example, close blockade. Now, in the Age of Sail, in the Napoleonic Wars, close blockade, i.e. you sit your fleet off of the enemy's ports and dare them to come out and try you, was something that could quite easily be done. And even to a certain extent in the American Civil War, this was done. But in the latter part of the 19th century, starting with the Crimean War, the development of first naval mines, originally also called torpedoes, and then later, latterly in the 19th century, the self-propelled torpedo, what we nowadays call a torpedo, started to make the idea of very close blockade where you could turn up with full-on capital ships somewhat dangerous. And then you got the deployment of torpedo boats and submarines and such like, and that made the deployment of capital ships even more dangerous. And suddenly, not only did the operational doctrine of close blockade pretty much collapse and it had to move to a distant blockade scenario, 
but it also forced the introduction of entirely new types of ships and entirely new fleet compositions because in the they say 1850s and 1860s a blockading squadron would be mostly composed of capital ships there might be a few frigates there might be a few light ships sloops etc but generally speaking they weren't there for any specific combat purpose they were there to do a little bit of scouting facilitate communications and that sort of thing most of the actual combat would just be done by the capital ships because there wasn't really anything that could threaten them apart from other capital ships whereas by the close of the 19th century and then going into the 20th you see what we conceive of as the full fleet screen developing you have big cruisers trying to back up the battleships and take out smaller cruisers you have smaller cruisers that are better suited to taking out destroyers and doing longer distance scouting to help position the entire fleet you have destroyers and torpedo boats who are trying to sink everything that's bigger than them and latterly with the destroyers also sink stuff that's about the same size as them and then you can even look at something like night action now night action wasn't necessarily something that couldn't be done before there were instances of night battles occurring in the age of sail but as you had these other advances with torpedoes and such like night action tended to become less and less favored simply because of the sheer destructive power involved or in various ships especially with their heavy guns and with torpedoes and the prospect of winning or losing a battle on the basis of a few minutes of action whereas even in the worst case ambushes in the age of sail generally speaking even in a close night action you could either try and fight your way free or you'd at least have five to ten minutes to work out just how stuffed you were before you decided which path was going to be open to you either trying to fight your way through break off or surrender but then you have again an advance in technology so searchlights become a thing then um night vision equipment effectively starts to become a thing in the interwar period radar then starts to show up in the very last bits of the interwar period and well and then obviously into world war ii and each of these iterative advances in technology enable more and more and varied night actions to come into place so in world war one night action still depended effectively on let's be honest effectively blundering into the enemy fleet because your vision in most cases was so badly restricted in it the night fighting tradition training etc focused more on what to do once you found yourself in a crazy close range pell-mell action rather than you know trying to find the enemy in the first place because it was broadly recognized that there's very little chance of that actually happening by design whereas once you get into world war ii with radar and the various night vision aids that were developed there was considerably more thought put into how you could actually find fix and ambush your opponent in a night action as well as the training that was involved in actually fighting a night battle de kerfurst asks how are damage report drawings made i can't imagine someone calmly walking around in a battle taking pictures or making sketches especially for sunken vessels where a vessel had been lost and they couldn't ex inspect the ship what they would usually do is start off with a basic outline diagram of the ship itself which should be known from plans and then they would interview any survivors of the ship as well as any other crewmen from other ships who had watched what had happened um, if possible if it was a victorious battle they might also take on enemy survivors as prisoners and interview them about what they saw so for example if a enemy torpedo bomber pilot uh, managed to put a torpedo into a ship but was subsequently shot down and captured he might be asked well where did you think you hit the ship um, because they're usually watching for this kind of thing so in this case this is Astoria which obviously was lost at the first battle of Savo Island but we have this damage map um, which shows where roughly everything is supposed to have hit so this was primarily composed by talking to the survivors and for those obviously in the various parts of the ship saying okay i think we were hit in this location of a by approximately this kind of shell and that will be correlated with what they knew of what the attackers were what anyone else had seen at the time and hence the diagram was drawn up 
And that's why on this diagram you have a multiplicity of different types of indicator as opposed to ships that managed to make it home where they could examine it more closely. So for those of you who maybe can't read the small text, the red icons are hits to port, the green icons are hit to, hits to starboard, most of the icons are large and that signifies 8 inch uh, AP hits. There's a few smaller ones which are 5 inch hits ostensibly from destroyers, but all the ones that are just outlines and not filled in are where a hit was reported but nobody is entirely sure what calibre it was or if that exact location of hit is certain, so where they can't establish consensus for the matter. There's also the point that, you know, if a ship is being damaged over time rather than being overwhelmed all at once, then the ship's log will quite often record where the ship was hit and how bad the damage was, let's say, if it was hit by one salvo at arbitrarily choosing a time, let's say, 2200, and the next gun action it doesn't it takes partakes in is 45 minutes later within the space of those 45 minutes someone will have recorded what happened and what the crew have ascertained from that within the ship's log hopefully maybe the very last hits that sink it in whatever subsequent action it takes might not be recorded but everything else probably will be and then if the ship's log therefore survives then you can obviously um go off of that. The other thing is of course some ships are lost well after the actual action so they might be fatally damaged but if it takes time for the ship to sink or if the ship is eventually declared to be unrecoverable and they decide to sink it themselves there will obviously be a lot more detailed um, records of the damage taken uh, before the ship is lost completely. That slow typing guy asks why was San Diego such a large and important naval base? Well, it still is a large and important naval base, but the reason for it specifically being such a base is that for a good chunk of its history, the US Navy, believe it or not, didn't actually have a naval port facility on the US West Coast. Initially, of course, when the, the 13 colonies and immediately after independence, they didn't have a West Coast. They were just based on the East. And so that's where the bulk of the US Navy was based. Then as time wore on and the US expanded across the American continent, the West Coast states were some of the last to be incorporated into the United States, and so there still wasn't a West Coast-based naval port. There was a US Pacific Squadron, but that was operating out of store ships in harbours and other locations rather than a dedicated dock facility. Then you had US interests in the Western Pacific beginning to build up, but that led to the creation of the Asiatic Squadron and then later the Asiatic Fleet. And after the Spanish-American War, then there were bases in the Philippines, but still, believe it or not, nothing permanent for the US Navy on the US West Coast. And it would only be around about the same time that... Under the Wilson administration, the US Navy was granted the funds and the political drive to expand to the level of a first rank power that they finally began looking for a potential permanent base on the US West Coast. And this would eventually turn out to be San Diego. So you had a brand new, first time ever we get to actually have a permanent port for the US Navy facility being constructed right at the point where the US Navy had massively expanded. So it had new battleships, new destroyers, new cruisers being built. And commensurate with that, the US interest in the Pacific was ramping up quite significantly as well. And so with the US fleet then becoming the battle force and the scouting force in the interwar period, uh, it became the main facility as where all US ships would be based, because Pearl Harbor, as a US naval facility, also didn't exist at this point. Now, granted, Pearl Harbor would become kind of the forward staging base for the US Navy right before the US involvement at the start of World War II, but San Diego remained an incredibly important facility because it was still considerably larger than Pearl Harbor, had considerably more facilities than Pearl Harbor, and of course being on the continental United States had a lot more direct access to the suppliers of major replacement component parts, whereas for Pearl Harbor it could do 
repairs generally, but if you need something really big, like, I don't know, replacement armor plates or a replacement gun turret or something like that, that had to be shipped to Pearl Harbor first over the ocean, whereas at San Diego it could literally turn up on a railway cart straight from the manufacturers. And so San Diego retained quite a degree of importance during World War II, and as I continued to do so through the last part of the 20th century and into today. Dan Haas asks, you mentioned at the end of the video on Astoria that when she sank the name of the class passed to New Orleans. Was this a common practice in the US Navy or indeed any other Navy of the time? I don't recall any other classes being renamed because of the sinking of the lead ship. I think I've answered a similar question to this before, but to recap, no, it's not very common at all. There are a few cases where it has ha also happened elsewhere, sometimes as a result of the Navy in question, sometimes actually as a result of just history thereafter, especially when a lead vessel has sunk relatively early into the overall class's career, so it can be very confusing to people if you have... Um, let's say, especially in the age of sail, if you have a class of ships that serves for three or four decades and virtually no one can find any reference to the obvious name that the class is named after because maybe that one went down in six months to a year after everything was launched. Um, but in the 20th century, you know, it's very uncommon. I think one of the major reasons why the Astoria class was renamed, not just the fact that, you know, it had been such a devastating battle, and to be fair, the um, the class was going in for some fairly heavy refits at the time, which kind of did change their visual profile a little bit, so it could be seen as a bit of a clean break. But I think the main thing is that at this point in World War II, the US was, Navy was very into almost immediately naming a new ship in honour of a fallen ship. So that's why you have Lexington, Hornet, Wasp, and Yorktown all serving as their original flavor carriers and also as Essex class carriers. And with Astoria, very soon after she was sunk, it was decided to rename one of the new Cleveland class cruisers that was under construction as USS Astoria, and that's the one you can see here. And of course, that could lead to some rather interesting bits of confusion because if you've got an Astoria class, which is your eight inch heavy cruisers, but USS Astoria, on the books, is serving alongside those, but is a six-inch gun light cruiser. That's going to confuse a few people, and you don't want that kind of easy confusion to happen generally, and more specifically, you don't want that kind of confusion to happen when it comes to stores, because all it would take would be for either someone to have a slightly outdated fleet roster and see that, oh yes, Astoria is an Astoria class heavy cruiser, therefore I shall make sure that supplies earmarked for Astoria include 8-inch gun charges and ammunition, or someone's only got a reference that talks about the USS Astoria as a Cleveland class, and then when they're asked, oh right, well we need some supplies for this other ship that's an Astoria class, they go, oh right, it's a Cleveland class, right, okay, so they're going to need 6-inch ammunition, and then, I don't know, USS New Orleans ends up with a bunch of useless six-inch ammo. These are the kind of minor supply issues that can blow up to be very big issues very quickly if you're not careful, and so I suspect that's one of the main reasons. If they're going to reuse the name in a different class of ship, better to rename the class to avoid these kinds of confusing incidents. Race Car Meerkat asks, you've previously named the British 15-inch 42, American 14-inch and Russian 12-inch as some of the most accurate naval artillery pieces. And what is the evidence for this, and what sources did you find this in? It's a combination of factors. So you have two kinds of primary source evidence and a fairly extensive battery of secondary source evidence. So with the secondary so source evidence, you've got various tomes like Norman Friedman's Naval Firepower and various other books that have been done about naval weaponry, naval guns specifically, and perhaps some slightly broader books that are histories of ships that are equipped with these kinds of guns. And consistently, when you see these various discussions, especially about things like the Gangots or the Queen Elizabeths or 
certain of the US standards once they fixed some of the issues with dispersion you'll see repeated comments by these historians saying these guns are particularly accurate and are known for this across naval history circles so that's a pretty good indication that you're on something but there's also the primary source evidence i.e the evidence that comes directly from the guns themselves and this takes two forms one of which is where you can find it looking at reports of gunfire um, or gunnery test records both testing the guns themselves usually done by the manufacturers sometimes by the navies and also the results of practice shoots now some of you might have seen various practice shoot cards from say something like an iowa class battleship and that'll show that it kind of looks a little bit like a an archery target or something similar and it shows right this is where we were aiming at and here's the clusters of shells that fell and where and then you can sort of judge from how far away did they fall from the target point and what was their dispersion and from that you can make a certain amount of judgment about the accuracy of the guns now obviously with any gun shooting as has been covered in various videos you've got to take into account things like the quality of your fire control the quality of your shells the quality of your propellant charges all sorts of other factors even the sea state that might affect your accuracy but then that's why you check multiple results but all of those other issues aside or if you have technology that can compensate for them like really good fire control systems well-spaced guns or delay coils sea states nice and calm and so on and so forth shell quality is good propellant charge temperature is consistent if the gun itself is not a particularly accurate weapon there is only so much that you can do to get an accurate hit at long range but if your gun is fundamentally a good quality weapon in terms of accuracy then that means that if you adjust for all those other controllable variables you will get lots of very tight groupings and so that all the shells will land close together and hopefully they'll also land fairly close to the target and to a certain degree even tight groupings on their own can be an indication of accuracy because that means that all the guns are obviously being fired at the same point and the shells are all landing near the same point where they actually land as a group might be off from where you were aiming but that's probably more to do with the fact that you weren't aiming properly rather than the guns themselves and so you can look say through all these various test shoot records and you can see that certain types of guns consistently get tighter groupings and consistently work their way onto target a lot faster than other types of guns so that gives you some evidence and then the other bit of primary source evidence is attestations from their opponents i.e people who have been shot at by these guns now granted that's sometimes somewhat thinner on the ground because naval guns tend to be used far less in action than they do in practice and also not all air accounts that someone will write about being shot at by enemy guns will talk particularly about the accuracy or the tightness of the grouping of the shots that are coming in because you know they might be somewhat distracted by the fact they are being shot at however when it comes to some of these weapons there are surviving accounts of this nature where comments are made specifically on the level of gunnery and the accuracy of the guns in question uh, as i've mentioned repeatedly on this channel before there's a couple of examples from the battle of jutland uh, especially during the run to the south when fifth battle squadron shows up where german sailors and officers are recording the fact that the 15 inch gun groupings are so tight that even though the sort of the where the shells are generally landing is close enough that under general dispersion the german battle cruisers could expect it to have received a couple of hits the grouping is actually so tight that even a, a an aim point near miss of a 50 or 100 meters means all the shells are landing away from the target ship which weirdly enough and in some ways can be a net negative if you if you've not got that direct bead on the target but conversely it also means that if you do manage to get a direct line of sight and good targeting on a moving vessel then the chances of any any individual salvo scoring multiple hits goes up considerably so we know from the accounts of the people who are being shot at that the 15 inch 42 was an exceptionally accurate gun plus obviously you have the odd one-off thing like 
war spite hitting Julia Cesare at Calabria, and so on and so forth. So that's another way of determining which guns are particularly accurate. Colin Cameron asks, if World War I did not happen and the UK versus Germany naval arms race petered out because of financial reasons, and therefore there's no Versailles Treaty and no World War II, at least in Europe, would the US Congress have allowed and financed the US Navy to expand enough to rival the Royal Navy? Probably not. The US at the time had a political divide wherein one side of that divide was quite often isolationist and therefore by definition didn't want a particularly large military, just enough to defend the US's shores. And the Wilson administration, when they got the 1916 Naval Act through, not entirely, but in large part, managed to get it through because of World War I and because of the various aggressions that American flagged and neutral shipping was suffering. Without World War I, though that impetus isn't there. It's going to be a much harder sell to the general American population. But on top of that, there's another factor which people do sometimes miss which is that it would be an even harder sell not just because the US and its shipping isn't being attacked but because there the bill itself would have to be considerably larger now you might think how in a minute what do you mean well the British and German naval arms race isn't going to just die out in 1914 you're going to have at least the three remaining R-class built on, on the British side. So you're going to have three a uh, total of eight Revenge class. Whatever Agincourt was going to be will also be built. So for conservatism's sake, we'll say it's another Queen Elizabeth. So you now have six Queen Elizabeths and eight Revenges. And there almost certainly would be four new capital ships in 1915 and four more in 1916. And maybe at that point it starts to wind down. But whatever succeeds the QEs and the Rs, whether they be a mixture of battleships and battle cruisers, or maybe a year of battle cruisers, or a year of fast battleships, or whatever, the overall point is that it just in those four years, Britain will have, well, five years if you include the QE build year, Britain will have constructed at minimum at least 22 modern capital ships, i.e. super dreadnoughts. Or to be more precise, second generation super dreadnoughts. So even if you discount all the 12 inch ships on both sides and discount, let's say we discount the 13.5 inch ships, 12 of which the Royal Navy has not including battle cruisers, against discounting them against the New York, Texas, Nevada and Oklahoma. So we're just going with 12 gun American battleships as compared to 15-inch and possibly larger British battleships, well, that means that when the 1916 Naval Act comes up, the US has Pennsylvania, Arizona, the three New Mexicos, and that's it. Um, either built or under construction at that point. And the British, as I just said, have at least 22 vessels either built or under construction. Historically, the US would obviously follow up with the Tennessees, two more. But it's such a huge mountain to climb, as they even somewhat unrealistically ignoring anything that has an armament less than 14 inches in calibre. And no matter how militant Wilson might get in Congress, I just can't see... Without the pressures of World War One, I, I can't see Congress granting him the authority he'd need to actually pass an even larger, more generous 1916 Naval Act. And obviously we don't know exactly how things would have gone historically, but by the early 1920s, the isolationist tendency was back in the US government and the whole thing got curtailed anyway. So without World War One, there's just no impetus, no drive for the US to do that. Connor Johnson asks, HMS Queen Elizabeth and Valiant were said to be the most modernised of the Queen Elizabeth class. However, Warspite was also modernised. What were the major differences between the two sets of ships, and were there any plans on modernising Barham and Malaya? Uh, 
So when it comes to talking about the upgrades to the Queen Elizabeth class, you have to understand that the Queen Elizabeths effectively existed in five major phases. You have them as originally built. You then have them with the various accreted upgrades that were made during World War One. You then have their first major modernization period, which ran through the 1920s and into the early 1930s. You then have the reconstruction period, which affects all but one of the ships. And then finally you have World War II, where obviously they acquire even more systems, mostly anti-aircraft and radar. And it's the confluence between phases three and four that we need to look at to answer this question. So during the 1920s and early 1930s, as I said, each of the ships had been modernised. And Barham was the last vessel to undergo that particular process. You then enter, as you get to the mid-1930s, what you might call the reconstruction period. The first ship to actually undergo this process was Malaya, not Warspite. Um, Warspite was second on the list. But Malaya kind of represents the, the last gasp effort to get something out of the ships in their approximately original hull forms. Obviously, there had been a lot of changes. Look at Queen Elizabeth as entering the Grand Fleet in 1914 compared to early 1930s, and they are visually distinct, but they're still recognisably an upgraded version. One is an upgraded version of the other. Malaya was kind of the end of the line for that, and they discovered that actually you couldn't address the modern upcoming threats that the Royal Navy had identified on that with that system, with the old propulsion net system in place, etc., etc., and so Warspite, which was the next one in, had the much more extensive reconstruction and modernization that we all know and love. However, it was only partial compared to Queen Elizabeth and Valiant. Barham and Malaya were due to have this. So Barham was due to go in after Queen Elizabeth and Valiant. The war put paid to that. And Malaya, after they realized that her initial attempt hadn't really worked out, were, was going to go in after Barham. Again, wartime meant that didn't work out. As far as major differences between Warspite and Queen Elizabeth and Valiant are concerned, there there's a lot of small details, things like are the aircraft cranes bent or straight and such like, but the two biggest differences are that Valiant and Queen Elizabeth had two extra boilers compared to Warspite, which they needed because they had additional weight put on them as compared to Warspite. And the other one, which is probably the most visually obvious difference, is that Warspite had her secondary casement-mounted six-inch gun battery reduced, but not entirely eliminated, and then a number of dedicated heavy anti-aircraft guns installed partially using up that weight. So she was kind of a halfway house in that regard, whereas Queen Elizabeth and Valiant both had their entire six-inch secondary battery removed and any other heavy AA guns that were present were completely removed and replaced by 20 4.5-inch dual-purpose weapons in uh, 10 twin mounts, five to a side. That is the single biggest visual distinction between Queen Elizabeth and Valiant on the one hand and Warspite on the other there aren't any surviving pla plans that I can see that talk about upgrading Warspite to the same standard. In theory, she could have been, and she would have needed it by the early to mid-1940s, but she was considerably more capable than either Barham or Malaya, and therefore they would have gone in first, at which point, um, assuming that the Repulse and Hood hadn't gone in as well, Nelson and Rodney would by then also be significantly less capable than even Warspite. So it's likely that even without war, Warspite probably would have stayed in that configuration or something close there too until the end of her career because by the time a slot came free to bring her up to the same or better standards as her sisters, it'll be within a few years of retirement anyway. 
War Daddy asks, do you know of any accounts, log entries, or anything of the type from U-boat captains or crew first encountering Dazzle camouflage? There is some testimony from some captured U-boat captains indicating that it might have been effective. The problem is that of the U-boat captains who are known to have engaged or sighted Dazzle camouflage ships and were subsequently captured, which is a relatively small number, considering that Dazzle Camo in World War One only came about right toward the end of the war, the reports vary. And I think it has more to do with the technique that individual captains used rather than anything specific about the camouflage, because it seems that the captains who sighted and determined their ship's bearing and size, etc., by looking at the hull generally did seem to have something of an issue with dealing with uh, Dazzle Camo, although it wasn't universal, whereas there was other groups of captains who were looking mainly at the masts and funnels of the ship, which there's only a limited amount you can do with those, and they were using those both in profile and relative position to each other to work out the heading and direction of the ship. And to a large extent, doing that can to greater or less do we actually defeat the purpose of dazzle camo because the whole point of dazzle camo isn't to hide the ship it's to make it it's to, it's to ensure that your calculations and your estimations of what direction the ship's going in and what speed it's going in are incorrect but if you are taking all those off of masts yards and funnels well then all the camo paint you've put on the hull doesn't really apply all that much um and that's by using things like relative bearing. So, for example, in the Zealandia that you can see here in uh, the in the picture, if you were trying to look at the hull itself, those lines might very well mess up your idea of where it's heading to a certain degree. Whereas, if you just look at it's in this case two funnels, uh, sorry, two masts and one funnel, you can tell by the alignment of the yards on the masts and the relative position and height of them that the ship is in fact pointing towards you. So if you imagine a clock where 12 o'clock is directly away from you, 6 o'clock is directly towards you, it's kind of at the 7.30, 8 o'clock position. And that's not actually too difficult to determine from uh, those. So I think the Dazzle Camo effectiveness by German report seems to, as I said, depend largely on how each individual captain was actually working out his data. Ger Variola asks, the US's 16-inch Mark 8 Super Heavy AP shell is often depicted as a kind of revolutionary invention or even a wonder weapon. Why didn't other navies use heavier, for their caliber, shells if they were that much more powerful, and indeed were they, at all? Also, what determines the normal weight of a given caliber, and how difficult is it to raise the shell weight to get a super heavy shell without ruining the ballistic properties of a given gun? Well, normal weight, it, for, at least for the dreadnought period, can be devised by two separate methods. One is if lots of different countries have guns of a set, the same caliber, 12 inch is a very easy example to go for, then you can look at the various individual countries' shell weights, average them out, and then obviously you can see the outliers and determine, right, well, this is a heavier than normal shell, and all of these ones that kind of cluster in the middle are normal weight shells, and maybe there's a, the odd light one. The other way to do it is just based on tradition. So guns have a given weight once, and this only really applies once you get to the longer barrel weapons, sort of 40, 45, 50 calibers long that you start to see with not immediately at the start of the pre-dreadnought era but shortly thereafter and just the sheer number of guns of different individual calibers and different countries manufacture means that an approximate ratio of gun caliber and gun weight versus shell weight can be graphed out approximately and then again as even if you are the only person with a gun of a particular caliber you can then look at where that gun caliber and gun weight sits on this curve and then if your shell is a significant statistical outlier on the heavy side then you could say it was a super heavier shell. As far as raising the weight of the shell it will change the ballistics of the shell so for a, if you're assuming that you're using the same amount of charge uh, 
a heavier shell will obviously not go as far, but it will carry its momentum and therefore its power of armor penetration considerably further within that flight arc. So using completely arbitrary figures, a, if your normal shell flies 25,000 yards at a given elevation, your super heavy shell might only go 22,000 yards at the same elevation with the same charge. But at, say, 20,000 yards, your super heavy shell will have more retained energy and therefore penetrate armor better at that range, potentially, than the normal weight shell, even though it's got a lot further to go, at least for a given angle of attack, which is another thing you have to take into account. Now, some nations, you could argue, actually did introduce this. So when you look at World War One, for example, the earlier British 13.5-inch gunships used a 13.5-inch shell of a given weight, but they found they didn't particularly like the relatively small increase in armour penetration power compared to the 12-inch gun. And so later 13.5-inch ships were equipped with a much heavier 13.5-inch shell. So like, you could argue in some ways maybe that's the first super heavy shell of the Dreadnought era, but at the same time, the main reason for introducing the heavier shells was because the British thought they're, the original shells they had were too light. So is that perhaps not you know, replacing an, a slightly too light shell with a more normal weight shell, especially if you are looking at it in terms of a graph because obviously there's not that many other nations out there with a 13.5 inch gun to compare to so you you have to use uh, your normal distribution graphs now as for why no one else went for super heavy shells and whether or not they were wonder weapons in world war ii it's kind of two parts of it those of you who've watched the channel regularly will know i'm not actually the biggest fan of the super heavy shell i personally think that it gets more of its kudos from the fact it was also being fired from a 50 cal 16 inch gun which made up a lot for the deficiencies that you'd experience if you were firing the same shell from uh, something like a 16 inch 45 on a south dakota class and you've got to bear in mind that one one of the primary aims of the super heavy shell was to increase the angle of fall and obviously the amount of force that the shell would exert during that fall so that you could engage in long-range gunnery to go through deck armor and again as i've said before frankly i just don't think the ranges of engagement that were shown to be realistic in world war ii and to be honest shown to be realistic by the better pre-war exercises support that kind of um notion that the super heavy shell is designed around simply because whilst yes it means it comes in at a steeper angle and yes it has a ferocious amount of deck hitting power it only has those things at ranges where you're very unlikely to hit anything in the first place, and at closer ranges, whilst it does carry a bit more force out with it, the increased angle of fall, because remember we mentioned that earlier, means that if it impacts against belt armour, which it's more likely to do in the grand scheme of things, it's actually going to be slightly less effective than using a slightly more normal weight shell at a higher velocity. Now, you can make different arguments for the use of a super heavy shell in, say, an 8-inch gun. The paradigm is, is slightly different for heavy cruisers, at least treaty and immediate post-treaty heavy cruisers. But in terms of battleship weaponry, I don't know. I, I don't think that the 16-inch Mark 8 super heavy AP shell is a particular wonder weapon. I would focus attention more than anything else on the gun itself. And again, not to belabor the point, but I have said before, if you loaded up an Iowa 16-inch 50 with a more normal weight 16-inch shell, that thing would have absolutely insane armor penetration, even more insane than the uh, Mark 8 at the kind of battle ranges we actually see people scoring hits against each other at during World War II. Because quite simply put, once you're up to that scale of naval artillery the range at which those guns can reach out is actually far in excess of any sensible naval gunnery range against a moving target. So the advantages in continued carriage of inertia or momentum that a super heavy shell would have when it came to just impacting generic belt armor, that 
sort of regiment is still quite a few thousand yards off beyond where you'd actually be effectively engaging the enemy. The Rogue Chief asks, Did the world's navies learn anything from the American Civil War aside from turreted guns on metal hulls are good? So a number of major lessons were learned, uh, one of which was the number of ships and the well, some nations at least learned the logistical tale that would be needed to maintain a blockade in the modern era with steam-powered vessels. Also, the monitor design itself sparked something of a monitor craze, albeit that that was coupled with another lesson from the American Civil War, which is that monitors don't do well at sea. Um, hence why I'm showing a picture of the Leitha monitor in Hungary, because, well, this was one of the first inspired by American monitors, but there was a large number of coastal defence and riverine monitors built in various places across the world. Also, some of the, uh, shall we say, more unique armouring systems that were tried in the American Civil War, and most of which inevitably failed, well, that was a fairly useful set of knowledge for everybody else. I don't go down this particular path, so things like laminated plates, um, weird up-and-over uses of things that more closely resemble railway track and so on and so forth. Also that high velocity guns with a fair degree of uh, penetration were in fact necessary. Um, the big smashing weapons, 11 inch, 15 inch, even 20 inch Dahlgrens that were developed during the American Civil War, whilst they were very useful at smashing up wooden ships and absolutely superb at smashing up things like fortifications, etc., it did become fairly evident to a lot of people fairly quickly that big, low-velocity weapons were not that good at actually pummeling armor, armored ships into submission. And so when you look at the immediate post-American Civil War naval armament across the world, you'll see a lot of 6, 7, 8, 9, even 10-inch weapons but with considerably higher muzzle velocities, and it only starts to creep back up into the sort of 12 inch and plus range that is broadly comparable with some of the Dahlgren guns of the American Civil War period by early to mid 1870s, by which point the gun technology has advanced to a point that those shells and are coming out with considerably more energy behind them than the early 1860s guns were. And then, of course, you get later revolutions, which reset that uh, for an another time, which leads to the run-up of the pre-dreadnought era. So due to the highly experimental nature of the American Civil War when it came to naval combat, there were, to be fair, an awful lot more of this is not how you do things in terms of lessons learned. But there were, as I say, also a few positives where people took certain ideas and ran with them in varying degrees and descriptions. And that brings us to the end of this week's Tridoc. <laughs> Thank you very much for listening, everybody. A uh, couple of small announcements. So now that the US seems to have actually confirmed that, yes, they are, in fact, going to open up in November, um, I can start putting a few more concrete details onto my plan trip for the US in Easterish time, uh, 2022. And one of the... One of those announcements that I can make is that, um, well, obviously I will be going over, but I will also be bringing a little support crew. So Mrs. Drack will, in fact, be coming as well, um, as well as a couple of uh, my friends who are going to act as, well, as the name suggests, the support crew, i.e. camera crew, um, driving crew, local tour guide, um, well, to the country as a whole. One of them is, in fact, from the States, and etc., etc. And uh, we've decided that, at least for the majority of the visit, it will be road trip time. So, yes, we're, going to, we're currently looking for a point-to-point -point hire of an RV, which should hopefully vastly decomplicate things in terms of flights, etc., because we'll just drive down the east coast. The only sticking point at the moment in the planning is whether we particularly want to drive all the way across the states as well. I have a feeling we may want to ditch the thing in possibly North Carolina or maybe Alabama and then fly the rest of the way. But we shall see. Uh, details are still being planned at that point. The only other 
of uh, Channel Admin is, does anybody, and you'll understand why in a minute I say in the UK, does anybody either have a home for or know of a museum that would like a small aircraft carrier lightly used? <laughs> I ask this because, uh, well, for the past year or so, I have had in my possession an approximately 10 or 11 foot long, highly detailed remote control model of HMS Hermes in her Falklands War configuration. Um, but to be perfectly honest, I do not have the time or, as it turns out, in fact, the vehicle to transport it around and use it. And as you might imagine, a rather heavy, completely watertight, fully functional probably around about 11 foot aircraft carrier takes up an awful lot of room so uh, my challenge to you if indeed you're in the uk because i don't even want to think what shipping costs would be internationally um but yeah if you happen to have, you know want a remote control warship maybe you already have a number of remote control warships and you have space to give uh, a massive version of HMS Hermes a good home, or indeed you work for, volunteer for, or know of a museum who would welcome it into their collection, because it is pretty much display quality, then drop me a line via Discord or via email, and I'm sure we can work something out. Because, frankly, at this point, um, I'm just going to trip over it and break it. So, or, possibly, given how well it's constructed, it might break me, neither of which is a particularly good outcome. So yeah, there you go. One HMS Hermes, slightly used and not sold to a shipbreaker. <laughs>